I'm outside Worcester's Museum and Art Gallery. I used to come here years ago when my son was little, and there's an activity space up on the upper floor, and you can they used to splash in water and you know try and learn how to paint. It was lovely because I never liked uh, toddler groups. I felt isolated and quite depressed in toddler groups. So uh, I found something that I liked, and I took him every, here every Tuesday. Now I haven't been for a while, and there's a lovely display of World War information so I put that uh, on the video and also information about New Zealand and Maoris so I, I might talk over the videos to explain a little bit about that as well so it's half term I've forgotten all about that so it's quite busy so I will be putting music over some of the uh, information just to uh, cut out any of the background noise hope you enjoy the video and I'll see you again soon Some beautiful entrance gates here. The Victoria Institute was erected as the city memorial of the Jubilee of Queen Victoria. This stone was laid on the 3rd of April, 1894. HRH, the Duke of York, Knight of the Garter, A gorgeous selection of individual artistic cards for purchase in the shop as you enter in the uh, museum and there's a lovely galleried landing as you go up into the main exhibits and once you go up the stairs which I'll show you in a moment uh, you'll see that there is a special exhibition on with the uh, impressive collection of works by Dame Laura Knight. Now I didn't go into that today it's a special ticketed event so I left that and carried on with the main exhibits. But it does say that Dame Laura Knight will celebrate her life and connections to Worcestershire. And Aitchkin Tan is travelling through art. And uh, this delves into the museum collections as well as showcasing some brand new commissions. And there's also Dinosaurs on Our Doorstep promises to be raw some fun for all the family. Later in 2024, they say that they're going to unveil the Worcester Story, a brand new museum gallery filled with favourite objects telling the story of the city. 
So when you go to the art gallery, it's free entry and it's now open on Sundays. And it also has Little Elle's Kitchen at the Balcony Cafe too. So there's uh, always refreshments on hand. I'll just read you the first and last paragraph of the uh, section on the sturgeon. It says, The sturgeon belongs to a group of very primitive fish which can be traced back many millions of years. Its huge torpedo-shaped elongated body and five rows of bony plate make it easily recognisable. And it says, During the spawning months, sometimes early February, March, May or late July, these fish are caught in large rivers throughout Europe and the British Isles. For many centuries, it has been a highly prized fish for the captor. The row or eggs from the female is none other than caviar. Sir Charles Hastings, this bust is of by Sir Thomas Brock, 1882. 
On finishing his medical training, Hastings chose to return as doctor to his hometown Worcester rather than take a wealthier practice elsewhere. He went on to start the British Medical Association in 1832. Hastings was fascinated by nature and was a key member of the Worcestershire Natural History Society, whose collections developed to become the History Museum. Worcester had long been known for the high quality of its cloth and gloving trades, but during the 18th and 19th centuries, new industries began to flourish in the city. The Worcester to Birmingham Canal was completed relatively late in 1815, opening up a new, faster route into the heartlands of the industrial Midlands. The position of Worcester as a River Severn port was less to its advantage, whereas seven estuary ports such as Gloucester were closer to the sea trade routes. The inland location of Worcester made it less commercially viable. When plans to deepen the Severn between Worcester and Colebrookdale were made in the 1840s, they were opposed by Gloucester, probably to prevent Worcester becoming an economic threat. Even Brunel's Great Western Railway did not reach Worcester until 1850s, and only then after much opposition. Edward Evans. Evans, along with William Hill, founded the Vinegar Makers Hill and Evans in 1830. By 1903, they had the largest vinegar works in the world, in Lowesmore. Evans was also managing director of the Worcester City and County Banking Company, and this sculpture was lent by the bank, by then part of Lloyd's, to the 1882 Worcestershire exhibition before entering the museum collection. Now, when I was outside the uh, museum, opposite the road was, I think, some flats or apartments which are part of Vinegar House by the looks of things, so uh, maybe it was there. Displayed on the base of this case of shells are some of the large and spectacular shells from excellent shell collection that uh, the museum has. It comprises of around 15,000 individual specimens from both the British Isles and foreign countries and seas. The collection is quite famous and even as far back as 1881 was described as being superior to anything of the kind in any other provincial museum. Albatrosses belong to a family of birds known as tube noses. This also includes the petrels and shearwaters. As its name suggests, these birds wander and roam for miles. One particular bird, which has been ringed, was recorded being 6,000 miles from its native locality. The only time you're likely to see a wandering albatross on land is when they return to their native breeding grounds in late January. Brock statues stand in towns and cities across the world, from Sydney and Toronto to Bangalore. Three busts can be seen in this museum, Sir Charles Hastings, Sir Douglas Galton, and a self-portrait of Brock himself. Elsewhere in the city, his statue of Queen Victoria stands outside Shire Hall, and his memorial to Bishop Philpot at Worcester Cathedral. His crowning glory was the Victoria Memorial outside Buckingham Palace, which led to his knighthood in 1911.
Maori and the sea. Mona, the sea, has long been a transport route and life-giving force for the Maori. The animals, birds and fish that lived around and in it were a source of food, tools and materials. Maori would often gift the first catch of the day back to the god of the sea, Tangaroa, and if the seafood were harder to harvest due to over-collecting, uh, a ban would be put in place so fish and shellfish populations could recover. The Maori would recite a blessing to Tangaroa to gain his respect and ask for protection during their voyages.
August to 3rd of January 1943. Dear Uncle Charlie, we were so relieved to hear that you were safe after all those months and with no word. Auntie Marjorie was crying, but don't worry, I'm looking after her. She's doing extra hours at her factory, but she says I can't say where or what in case a Nazi reads this. I talked to Mum and Dad about going home to Birmingham, where they say that the bombing still makes it too dangerous. I miss them, but it's nice staying here near the country. We've saved this food from our rations for you, and Grandma has knitted you socks and a scarf. It's in Worcester football colour cl- colours for you. We'll send you out more as soon as we can. Auntie Maggie sends her love, Jimmy. Now, this boy had escaped the bombing in Birmingham by going to live with his aunt, a factory worker in Worcester.